Hey, 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 it's Rebecca, and you're listening to Resilient by Design. Today's podcast guest is Eric Dillman. He's an interior designer from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He invited me onto his podcast, and then after I was a guest on his podcast, I said, dude, you better come be on my podcast. I think it's really interesting. Um, His podcast is called The Pro Series with Eric Dillman. And in his podcast, he interviews HGTV stars and other design, construction, and real estate professionals from all over the world. He has since connected me with designers in Australia and in America, the great America. Um, But it's a really great conversation. He has interesting knowledge from interviewing all these HGTV hosts. Today in the episode, we talk about that, like what that experience is like and how we even got connected with all these HGTV stars in the first place, how a lot of those hosts and stars came to be. Uh, we really dive into a conversation about social media and Instagram, and I think it's a, it's a good one because I love having these candid conversations about what we're seeing happening in the world of social, the algorithms, where people are at, the type of content we need to put out, and then he shares his thoughts and opinions on you know, um, branding. And I I think there's two schools of thought. So I'm interested in what you guys think. So give this episode a listen with Eric Dillman and let me know what you think. All right. (laughs) I'm Rebecca Hay, and I've built a successful interior design business by trial and error, podcasts, online courses, and so many freaking books. Over the last decade, I've grown from an insecure student to having false starts to careers, and now I'm finally in the place where I want to be. Throughout my journey, it's been pretty obvious that I'm passionate about business and helping other entrepreneurs do the same. Each week, I'll share tangible takeaways from my own experience and the experiences of other badass women to help you build your confidence and change your business. Welcome to the podcast, Eric. I'm excited to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. It's funny. We met because I was a guest on your podcast. And then I was like, hey, you should come be on my podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Connecting (laughs) in different ways. I mean, social media is an amazing tool now. It totally is. Do you want to maybe just uh, let everyone listening know a little bit about who you are and your podcast and what it is? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I'm an interior designer based out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, I have my own podcast called Pro Series with Eric Doman. I talk to professionals like yourself from all around the world. Uh, I talk to people, not just, it kind of started as uh, Pittsburgh based and I kind of only wanted to make it um, just helping customers in our area educate themselves on what to design in their house for resale. And originally, I wasn't even a p- part of this. Like, it was strictly I was asking other professionals and I was posting their videos on my page. Um, and that was just, I w- wasn't comfortable in front of the camera at that time. And it's kind of something that I've grown into these interviews and I've talked to HGTV people, um, different hosts and stuff. And that's kind of, my niche now. Um, and I just love talking to people outside of my bubble. Um, a design is very similar in areas, but it's also very different in a lot of areas too. So it's kind of cool to get other people's, um, points of view on it. Yeah, totally. I mean, I've listened to your podcast and you've got some really interesting guests who did things like foreclosures and just some wild stuff and that stuff that we don't really see so much in Canada, or at least not in my region. So I think it's really interesting. What I would love to know, and I I know we're going to talk about connecting and how we connect with other designers. I think it's really important conversation, but like, let's start it off with HGTV. So how on earth did you meet all these HGTV hosts and stars and, and get them on your podcast. Um, I just think it's super niche and really interesting. I don't know if you know that I worked for several years in HGTV as a production designer. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah. When I first started my business, I worked for Property Brothers. I was like nine months pregnant with my son. Uh, I worked with um, Scott McGilvery on Income Property. There's a couple other shows, but 
we we did the design behind the scenes for these design shows. And so yeah. I've seen it from the backside of things. And so I just think it's really interesting that there's that sort of, we didn't even talk about this on your podcast, but we kind of have that slight connection. So how did you get connected with HGTV or these people? Uh, honestly, it just kind of came out of nowhere. Uh, my page, I created as a um, kind of a portfolio when I was early on in my career for um, myself and future clients. So I'd post not only my work, but also other designers that inspired me. So their work as well and give them credit um, for what they've done. And for somehow I'd get likes or follows um, from these HGTV people. Um, I think it's probably just through hashtags. Um, searching and stuff from their teams. It's probably not them, but it's, you know, it's from their sometimes, account. Sometimes it is them. Sometimes yeah. it is. Yeah. And um, I think I got way, my first one was, I think, Ward Schrader from Bargain Mansions. He does it with Tamara Day, his daughter. Um, and that was like my very first face-to-face -face interview ever um, for the Pro Series. And that's kind of what started the interview process is crazy first one to do um but and then Tarek um Elmusa from Flipper Flop he like commented on one of my personal kitchen designs and I thought that was amazing because I've looked up to him not only just I mean he's not a designer but he he has a great business going for him and um what he does for flipping homes and it just I think that wasn't just enough to give me the courage to just start asking them and as that went down, it was kind of like a domino effect of they see another one on my page. They kind of are okay with doing the podcast. So cool. Yeah. So you just like slide into their DMs. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You don't, yeah. I have never, I've definitely not been very confident to be on the screen before um, in the past years, like pre COVID, but I was never afraid to message someone or comment on their, um, social media. Um, that's just, I don't know. I've never been afraid of that because what are they going to say? No. And you're probably not going to see them again. So what, what matters after that? Oh, that's, you know what though, that is such a great, that's a great, um, conversation point to have because I think a lot of us, and I would probably argue more so women than men are very nervous about, being rejected. It's like this fear of rejection. And I, I always mindset, like I'm so passionate about mindset and, and how it controls us, but how wanting to connect with somebody, like, I love that you just put it out there and you're so right that what's the worst that can happen. They say no, and I'm no further ahead or behind than I was before. But so many of us, and like I catch myself doing that. Like I want to maybe invite someone to be a podcast guest, or I don't know, do, do collaborate with me in some, some capacity and I'm like, oh, well, they're a really big deal. They probably don't. They're probably not interested in working with me. Like, I'm just this little guy or whatever it might be. And I think I, I think we all need to rem remind ourselves that. Like, it's such a great point that what's the worst can, can happen? Exactly. And they've all been in the same position as we have. Everybody starts at zero at some point in their life. Some people might not remember um, that feeling of being at zero. Um, and that's usually when they say no, or they just totally ignore you or give you the cold shoulder. But um, the ones that do message back and want to do it, they, I, I truly feel like they understand where they're com like I'm coming from or where, where everybody else is coming from and wants to help out in any way they can. Yeah, it's like we have this perception that someone who's further ahead than us in whatever, in whatever alley, whatever, whatever respect is no longer interested in the little guy, but it's, yeah. it's, it couldn't be further from the truth. Like so many people actually want to help because you're right. They've been in that position and they know what that's like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's something to remember as we grow as well. Um, Cause it will happen. <laughs> um, but uh, keep that in mind, how you felt when you started and always, and I wouldn't even say the little guy, I would just say someone that's, just starting out to be big. Um, they're on the road to success in any way you can help them. Obviously, taking account of your time and um, mm -hmm. your business and the time in your business, but also think about what they need help with. 
So let's talk about that, like that, that idea of connecting with other designers. I've always said, you know, collaboration over competition. I think we are stronger together. I don't think we're each other's competition. Um, it's really interesting. I was just uh, a guest on um, another podcast with the host. It's called The Well Design Business with Luann Nigara. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's in yeah. the US. It's a pretty big one. It's pretty exciting. I'm very excited to be on it. But Luann said something that really resonated with me where she said, you know, there's a lot of people, because my course is about process, right? She's mm-hmm. like, there's lots of people teaching about process. Even Luann Luann has her own courses about process in her like Luann U, like her whatever online school. She said, but each one of us comes at it with a different perspective. So we're not really competition because we know there's enough designers out there that want to learn. They all want to just learn from somebody else. And it's the same that goes for the interior design world, right? Mm -hmm. The client that wants to work with you or Sally down the street or whoever in Florida, they they're not all, they all are not all looking for the same thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you, I think, have you seen that? Oh yeah. And I mean, this past week, my guest um, is a designer in my town and a lot of people are like, why, why did you do that? Like, that makes no sense. You're kind of promoting, um, you know, a, a competitor the competition in your yeah. backyard. Um, and I don't see it that way. Um, I, Every designer is known or is good at one specific thing. Like I have a friend that she strictly does bathrooms and I'm not very particularly fond of doing bathrooms or just like (laughs) haven't had enough success with them. Um, And I always ask them questions Um, and that's bouncing off ideas is not a problem. You know, everybody's experienced in different ways. Um, design is not just kitchens or just just bathrooms or residential or commercial use. There's so many little slivers of it that a lot of people don't even face and ever have experience with. So it's always great to keep your options open and be connected with other people because you never know that they might pass on a lead to you or you might pass a lead on to them or they might know someone um, closer to you that they would refer you to. So I, it's never good to break a bridge down for any type of business like that. Yeah. And the more, the more people you connect with, the more your name gets out there, right? It's just, it's like that they say like, uh, what is it? No press, bad press is good press or no press is bad press or something like that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Totally. I mean, I I would say that probably what happens is designers specifically or creatives, artists tend to be competitive a little bit by nature because it's so personal Mm -hmm. and it's not um, what we do is so personal. So, you know, I'm looking at, I'm in my son's room recording right now. I'm looking at these like drapes that I think are so gorgeous that I designed that are like, na- like, gr- like Kelly green with like a Navy ribbon and cream and their linen. They're beautiful. And so I always think that the things that I'm creating are like the best version of me. And so you get a little protective sometimes of your work or your design. And so you don't want to connect with the other people because, oh, well, they're really good too. And I don't want other people to know that they're good because then they're not going to think I'm good. Mm-hmm. Give her like, I don't know if people ever feel that way. I feel like as creative sometimes that's how we, that's how we see this competition mm-hmm. less that less so of I'm selling toothbrushes and he's selling toothbrushes. I'm not going to promote him yeah, because we're, we're selling ourselves really in what we're doing. But if anything, that makes us more unique in what we're selling. Exactly. And, and I think I've talked about this with one of my guests. It's in our profession There are so many, no matter where you are, there's so many people, um, population in your city or your town, and everyone has their own house. Everyone has their own apartment. If they rent, buy or whatever, they're all going to need your help at some point. There's no way you can help out every single person in your town. So having the competition is fine. You market yourself the way you want to market yourself. If someone personally likes you and hires you, that's great. And and that's something early on in my career, I got trained on um, the disc. I'm not sure if you know the disc. It's like behavioral styles and learning mm-hmm. what... What's the disc? Like D-I-S-C? 
Yes. Yes. And it's different. Like D is someone that's very, um, not kind of like demanding. So they want the facts. They don't want all like the sugar coat. You just give them the pricing, why it's that price. Um, C is someone that it's kind of the same way, but it's very, very detail oriented. They want to know every detail of that quote, all the breakdowns. Um, and I is someone that can't be on task too long. They're very outgoing. They're very bubbly. Um, you kind of have to bring in a little bit of about the business and then kind of talk about their family or something off topic. Um, and S's are someone that is very, very um, relationship driven. So they're very worried about if you like them and you, if you um, if that relationship is going to bond. Um, so asking them about their family, asking them about their house, complimenting um, their family or their house or anything in their house. So, I mean, I think that's a huge thing in our career as well, um, because not everybody's going to bond the same way. So you're the client that your friend down the street is on um, working with, you might not necessarily bond with them and it wouldn't have worked out anyway. So I'm very, very um, big on behavioral styles and learning how to adapt to them and being kind of a chameleon and kind of drifting towards how they work. Mm, yeah, it's so true. It's like, it's just like friends or it's like dating, right? You're, yeah. you're not you don't want to go into a relationship with everybody. Like, you know, if you're attracted to someone of the opposite sex, let's say, and you see five, for me, I'm a woman and I'm attracted to the opposite sex. I see five guys. I don't, I'm not interested in all five of them necessarily. Yeah. I may not even be interested in any of them, or maybe mm-hmm. there's one, or maybe there's two. Like we, there's a personality. I mean, there's so many elements there, obviously to attraction, but it's, it's so true. Clients, it's no different. You know, you need to make sure it's the right fit. And what I think is so important, and I'm curious sort of your experience with this with social media, because you have such a big social media following, is I think the, there's so much power in being authentic in your marketing and being authentic to who you are when you're putting yourself out there, because that's how you're going to attract the people who will resonate with you. Oh, yeah. 100% agree. Yeah. But and You I, can't I be I'm everything sh- to everyone. No. And I think I struggled with that up until probably maybe halfway through last year or starting the beginning of this year, not really posting truly to me um, and how I am. I didn't really put myself as the brand. It was more just my logo was my brand. Um, and that makes your your brand and your social media very flat and not very um, personal. And as I brought myself into it and brought some of my family stuff, so I brought my, my dog into it. Um, she does some posts now too. Um, <laughs> Dogs really trend on Instagram. <laughs> yes, yes. And, I, and I've gotten a lot of messages that people want more posts of my dog, which I don't know which way to take that. Like they, they want more posts <laughs> about my dog and not me. Um, but yeah, that's, it's personality is huge. Um, and that's, like if you hire anybody to come to your house to do any big project that involves a lot of money, you need to be able to get along with them. And you need to understand that like you could call them if something goes bad during the process. In our business, we're selling a job and they're not getting installed for months and months out, um, sometimes a year out, given the states that we're in right now with um, lead times and stuff. So you need to be able to bond with them and showing on your own social media, um, your personality kind of filters that out. So customers can actually feel the way you are and the way you work um, before they reach out to you. Yeah. I mean, I I say this a lot, but I I feel as though for a while I was doing a YouTube series. I don't, haven't done it in a long time, but uh, it's a lot of work. I'll just tell you. <laughs> I imagine. Um, this was like back in 2018, 2019. And I remember going to a consultation at that time with now one of my best clients. And I, I arrived at the consultation. It was at a condo. And I walked in and the client was like, I just feel like I need to give you a hug. She's like, Rebecca, I just feel like I know you. Like, I just, I feel like I'm your, like, I'm like your friend. She's like, I know it's kind of creepy and weird because I like, I follow you. And, and she gave me a hug and I'm like, I'm all cool with that. I'm all about hugging. Um, and then afterwards, you know, they were interviewing different designers. And when they finally decided to go ahead with us, they said that one of the deciding factors 
was the YouTube channel because they had seen me shine a light on things that can go wrong on the realities of a renovation. She said she liked that I didn't sugarcoat it and that I was honest and transparent. And I thought, wow, Wow. what a great, um, what a great example to show that being yourself and just putting it out there and doing you can really bring, and they were the best freaking clients. They've even been guests on my podcast. That's how amazing they are. (laughs) Wow. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So maybe I should do the YouTube again, but no, it was, um, it was the fact that I was being myself. Absolutely. And that could get you, I remember very early on the company that I was with didn't have the product for this client. Um, and so I couldn't help them out, but they really liked me and they were a great referral process, even though I couldn't give them the product that they wanted. Um, they gave me so many of their family and friends that they sent for referrals and just because they liked me and they liked my personality. And this was actually before my social media. So it's, you give an impact on someone, even if you don't necessarily help them. Mm, yeah. So what do you think your social, so speaking of your social media, like what do you think has been instrumental to the growth of, and I know that, you know, the algorithms are changing and Instagram's changing and, um, it doesn't matter. Well, tell me your thoughts. I want to hear your thoughts. No, it does matter. And the algorithm is a mess right now. I read up on it all the time. And right now it's like the worst it's in my opinion it's ever been. Um, I'm someone that posts the same thing on all of my social media platforms because there's some people that don't have Instagram, they don't have Facebook or they don't have whatever or they don't have a podcast um, app or whatever. And that actually hurts you on Instagram now. Um, They may, if you post non-original content to Instagram, you're going down on the list of being viewed by even people that follow you. So it's really hurting a lot of people right now. And um, hopefully that's going to change soon. But right now it's very, very hard to grow on social media. I've seen it in my numbers. TikTok is where it's at right now with um, growing wise. And I think everybody's trying to be them. And it's just kind of like when Instagram came out, everybody was trying to be Instagram Mm -hmm. Um, and same with Twitter. So, I mean, it's a lot of reading up on each algorithm and learning about the trends and trying to fit that with your brand because necessarily a lot of the trends are, you know, dance videos and that has nothing to do with design. So I'm not going to do yeah. them. Also um, like creating those dance videos. I am sorry. That is so time consuming. <laughs> it is. And I actually had, um, I've had a couple, well, actually like three or four different TikTok people on my um, podcast where they have become millions and millions of followers on TikTok by renovations. So they, they renovate their homes and they become real, real big. And, um, they, they talk to me about like creating content and in our niche, it costs money to create this content and dancing. You don't, you know, not that it's not hard cause I can't do it. And I give them all kudos to people that could dance. Um, but you're not, you're not paying for anything to create that content. That's, you put a song on and you dance, we have to create, if you're doing it in your house or you're doing it at a customer's house, it's hard to pay for all the materials just for one post. So it's, yeah, that's the hard part, trying to find filler content on social media that also keeps the interest of your followers to help you keep growing. So are you on TikTok also then? I am. So what are you seeing as like the key differences right now between the two platforms in your opinion? Um, so I like them both for our, our niche, just because everything's visual and interior design. So they're both very, very good for it. Um, TikTok, I haven't really figured out how the algorithm works. I just know it's very, very good and great to grow on because it's the latest and greatest. Um, but it's hard to keep 
or make a video in the short amount of time that TikTok allows for a post. So I could post, you know, a half an hour video on Instagram or YouTube or Facebook and almost be like a whole episode of a show. But on TikTok, you can't do that. So you're compressing a lot of information into one video, um, mm-hmm. which is the hard part. You get the point across and not lose out on any context. So, yeah. I mean, that and then you have to be consistent and consistency on TikTok is different than Instagram. You don't have to post every day on Instagram to grow. I do it like twice a week. TikTok, if you're not doing it every day, people forget about you. Um, oh my gosh, that's my so, problem. I was like, I'm starting a new TikTok account because TikTok rewards you when you post every day. I posted every day for like a week and then I fell off. I'm like, I should have yeah. just used the old the old TikTok account. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's hard. So hard. Oh my gosh. It's so hard. Yeah, I like the idea of only posting once or twice a week. And that in my in itself is hard. I post once about my podcast and then something else that's going on that week, which is hard to come up with. But um yeah, I, I would you agree that I mean Instagram has moved so much in the direction of perfection because it used to be like share your snaps, right? And I I feel like my Instagram grew the most when stories were really um the thing because I love to just show up, yeah, uh, unfiltered, unperfect, and just share and be transparent. And so when stories were big, my Instagram had major growth. And then it kind of shifted to like, now it's reels and reels have to be like so perfect and pretty, and at least in our industry, right? Um, I'm not sure about other industries, but and the, every, the feed has to be perfect and now I'm hearing that TikTok is more like Instagram stories wise, where it's, yes, there's the dance videos, but people are just showing up and talking and people are getting their news now. Like my husband gets recipes from TikTok. Like oh, yeah. he is, oh my God, it's totally different. And so I'm still trying to figure out, I mean, you have to know where your clients are too. And that's the other challenge. Just because TikTok is popular, it, like, is it worth the time investment if you're trying to attract local interior design clients it may not be yeah i think tiktok's hard to grow locally it's easier to grow like globally um i there are hashtags there are um geotags and stuff for posts to say where you are but i think it's easier to grow in your location on facebook or instagram other than tiktok do you think designers maybe get caught up in the creation aspect of it because we're creatives? We're like, oh, now I need to create for TikTok and I need to create a YouTube channel and sometimes forget about what the purpose is of doing it. Oh, yeah. And I think um, that's the whole point of both of their business models. They're they're making it harder and harder for us to grow and get out there because they want you to create more. They want more content on their platforms um, and they want more money. Um, I mean, I love Instagram. It's how I got to where I am, but it's not the same. Back in 2018, when I started, it was a lot easier and a lot, in my opinion, a lot better of a platform. Um, It just, it's becoming too big and they're trying to change a lot of things that weren't broke and it's harder for small businesses like us to survive. Yeah. What is with that? What is it's human nature? It seems to continually try to change and improve things when there's nothing wrong with them in the first place. Oh yeah, exactly. I mean, <laughs> like in general, yeah. what's with that? It, it makes no sense. Just when you like something, they'll change it. I went through something, I'm trying to think of it, it was like literally yesterday with my husband where there was some technology, I'm trying to think what it was. It was like for our house, for like locking something. And I was just like, why don't you just press the button? Like, why do we have to overcomplicate it? So, and now there's like a tech issue. Like what happened to just pressing the button? Like what was wrong with that? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Like whatever happened to just posting a picture and growing that way. Now we'd have hashtags and then a sound and geotagged and all this stuff. Yeah, I guess it's it's it's, it's a relatively new. I'm saying that as a 41 year old. So when I grew up, this none of this existed. Like the yeah. internet didn't even exist when I was a kid. So it, it's I think it's we're all trying to 
it's new. And so for a while, it felt like this is it. It's Instagram and Facebook. And now there's other players and there's like Clubhouse and TikTok and Lord knows all these other things that I'm not even using. There's like some neighborhood one that's big in the U.S. now. It's oh, yeah. called Next Door. Next Door. I got a, I got a piece of mail in the mail saying, hey, like such and such a neighborhood, you should join us on Next Door. Yeah. Um, and I'm like, clearly the platform hasn't taken off if they need to give me a paper mail to tell me to join their community. Well, that's how they grew. Like, so like when I moved into my neighborhoods, one of my neighbors requested me to join and it doesn't send you an electronic one. They send it in the mail. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Cause they don't have your contact information. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So like they can't send you an email oh or a phone number. So they I haven't signed up. I suppose I should. I mean, in the U.S., it's very, very convenient. It's um, it's like Facebook, but for strictly your neighborhood. And you're like, you're, I don't know if they have HOAs over there. Um, yeah. But that it helps with that. Yeah. We have like a local WhatsApp group for people. But you're right. You have to meet the person, get their information, add them to the group. Someone has to administer it. Um, anyways, we digress. There's just so many <laughs> platforms now. It's crazy. It, it um, is. And so I, th- I know that as designers, we're always trying to find out like, where should I be? What's the next thing? And it's hard to keep up with it. Mm-hmm. What have you learned from all these like celebrity ho- guests that you've had or hosts that you've had on your podcast? Have they given you any insight into sort of social media and growing there? Uh, not really social media. It's more advice on how they got to where they are. Um, and I guess it's, it kind of goes with social media and it's just kind of like staying consistent, just do you um, and opportunities just come about when they're meant to be. Um, don't keep, it usually happens like when you're not looking for something that, you know, you get it. Um, so, I mean, it, they've always just said, just be you and keep doing you and then something will come about. Would you say, and this is a little bit of a tangent here, but of these these um, TV show hosts that have mm-hmm. had such success and they have their own shows, most of them, um, would you say that the opportunities came knocking at their door or did they pursue them actively? Uh, for the most part, it's all come knocking on the door. It's knowing someone or someone reached out to a producer and told them about them. I think there was a couple that um, tried out, but it's mostly just exactly doing what they're doing, um, living their life and they just come to them. Yeah. That's interesting because I, you know, I, I'm of two mindsets. One is of that mindset. And then the other mindset that doesn't come naturally to me, but I feel like is beneficial is to be your own advocate. And if you want something, you need to go after it. Right. Yeah, exactly. And make it happen. Like studio McGee, they, they were approached right initially. And then HGTV told them, no, like you're not interesting enough for a show basically. Mm. And then, uh, and then they're like, screw it. We're just going to make it happen. Yeah, exactly. And they really became big on Instagram. And I started following Shay when she had their company had a different name. It was like Shay to something. I don't remember what it was. Okay. She, she had like 4,000 followers like five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's just, i'm like oh this is a pretty- cool designer because I, I was really into instagram early i was an early adopter i'm like oh, i really like her style and then i'm like oh she changed her name to studio mcgee and now she's like three million followers yeah Crazy. yeah i mean i i've talked to people that um have had instagram or not instagram have had shows on different networks and they're taken off air or they're not picked up for certain reasons um and hearing their reasons are very, it's very sad. Um, but it kind of, I mean, it just kind of saddens you on why people are being judged for certain reasons and why they're only getting picked up for shows for certain reasons, um, which is just so disappointing. But yeah, it just, they, it just comes knocking on their doors for the most part. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Um, yeah. So what about, let's talk about branding. I know this is something that you uh, feel passionate about. And it's interesting because when I had this conversation recently with Luann, she was talking about this brand, I have a brand strategy person and how powerful brand strategy can be. And and like, it's something that I, I value 
but not enough that I've spent thousands and thousands of dollars on it, Mm -hmm. but that I see other companies really honing in on their branding and they just explode. Do you, like, I'm curious your thoughts when it comes to that, how important is branding and having a consistent look in growing your business or your online presence? I think it's huge. Um, In the beginning, I, the logo behind me, we, in college, we had a brand, all of our products. So we, it was like the very first semester we had to come up with the logo and a company name. I've always been Eric Doman Designs, and that was the logo I created. Um, and it, I've never stopped using it just because it's kind of become something that people have, at least in my friend group or my followers, know what that is now. Um, and I used to put it on every single post. Um, but it was becoming to the point where I think it was kind of in your face, and I didn't want it to be that way. So I kind of brought it back and I think mostly now I'm just trying to make it look like I come up with a post on the spot kind of organically and not a lot of thought into that. And I think that's what a lot of people or my followers like. It's not very polished, not very, I don't have a team to help me create with my brand, not a team to help me with my photos. I do everything hundred percent myself. I edit my podcast. I do all the scheduling myself. Um, and I'm very proud of that. And I want people to see that they could do that as well. And I think that's why a lot of people follow me. Um, and they know I can help them out if they ever reach out. Um, so that's basically my brand and that's what I've tried to show the past few years. Um, before I actually put my brand on everything. So what to you brand is sort of how you show up. It's not the colors and the logo, although you have a logo. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there are some people that use like a certain filter per post. So every post looks the same. Um, I like that to an extent, but sometimes it drowns your design. Like if you have very high color, um, and that's not their aesthetic for their um, page. I think that really hurts them because it might, if they're a very big monotone type of design group and they have a customer that's very vibrant um, and they don't want to post it because of they're going to ruin their aesthetic on their page. I think that just hurts them in the long run because there might be a customer that sees that and loves it and that might give them a new client. And it shows that you're not this. You're not doing the same design over and over and over again. Um, and I kind of felt that way when when I post pictures of my house. I do have a lot of things that are black, like the black wall behind me, because um, that's just my my favorite color, and I love using black in designs. Um, and I try not to post a lot about that, just because it kind of. I don't want people to think that's the only thing I can do. So that's interesting to hear you say that because I feel like I've heard the flip side of that coin too, where, um, you know, some coaches say you want to be known for one thing. And then when you're known for one thing, people are drawn to you. So Mm -hmm. what I, what I say to that is it's personal preference, I think. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I don't agree to that at all. I think that hurts you in the long run and that makes you too niche in the profession and, you don't want that because, and then that really, really slims your chances of getting a client and that client could bring you 10 referrals. They can make that, or that client could be, have, you know, maybe a producer in their family that got your show or something like that. Um, so I think that really just really filters your clientele out a lot. Yeah. I think that's interesting because I, I have seen it work both ways where Mm -hmm. I've seen certain designers just want to do one aesthetic, right? That's all they want to do. Like maybe they just like, there's a designer I know that just does mostly black and white with a pop of color and it's all black and white and that's her jam. And she's finally at a place where she only gets clients who want that because that's what she puts out into the world. Yeah. But then there's other clients or not clients, designers like you who are like, I don't want to pigeonhole myself because I enjoy challenging myself and doing different things. Yeah. So if you put that wishy-washy filter that everyone on freaking Instagram is using that makes everything look moody and (laughs) taupe, then you're only going to attract clients that want moody taupe interiors. And so if that's not your jam, don't do what everyone else is doing. 
Exactly. Stay and in your lane. <laughs> exactly. And I'm very big on designing for the client and not designing for your portfolio. And I think a lot of designers design for their portfolio. And I think that's that what I don't want to say that makes you a bad designer, but it's really hurting your it just hurts my design art to do that. Because you're not designing for them. You're designing for yourself. It's not your money. It's not your house. You're not going to spend time in it. So you have no right to push your aesthetic or your design on someone that doesn't, that that's not going to help them in the long run. It's not going to make them feel like they're in their own home. And you know, if that's your mindset, then that to me is a really great marketing differentiator. Like that is something that I would shout to the rooftops because probably there are clients out there who want to work with a designer who is like that, who values the the designer, sorry, the client's own design aesthetic as opposed to what, what they always do. Yeah. So that's, exactly. I would shout that to the rooftops. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I know there's a designer in my area that this person does one design um, and one design only. If you don't like it, you can go somewhere else. And I was just in shock when I heard that. And because I like, I'll have my um, original design to them and then we'll tweak it to personalize them. Cause I want to walk through say the kitchen project and see like, do you put your hard work? Do you put your silverware here? Where do you put your plates? Like, cause you're not, I want to personalize it cause it's their space. They're spending a lot of money. Um, and I want to spend that extra, you know, hour with them to do that. Cause I think that goes a long way than just checking a box, getting the sale done. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I mean, that's where you that's where you can uh, differentiate yourself again, right? Just having that mm-hmm. personalized and talking about the process. Like it all comes down to in my experience to market and attract those clients. You need to let them know what you do and how you add value beyond making it look pretty. Because I think yeah. as designers, and I don't know if you see the same thing, but especially on Instagram, we're always talking about the colors. Like I just did it. I was talking about the drapes, right? Like talking about the pretty. And I think that when clients come to us, they take that, they assume, obviously you're going to make it nice, but what else about you is why I will hire you? Because mm-hmm. I'm assuming you're a designer. I'm assuming you're going to make it look good, but what's your process like? Or how how do you interact with your clients? Or you name it. And I think those are the elements that differentiate you in your marketing. And if you can show that in your Instagram or in your TikTok or wherever it is you show up on your mm-hmm. website, then I think that that will help you grow and attract the right people to you as opposed to, like I see a lot of designers, a lot of designers come to me and they ask, they're like, I'm not getting the right clients. The wrong people are calling me. Like they don't have enough money. They don't value my expertise. And so the question I always have is, well, what are you putting out into the world? And I had this for a while, a few years ago, where I was like, why do we keep getting this type of client? Mm-hmm. I want this a client with this level of, of design aesthetic. I want a client who has this much money. And I really looked inward and I said, let's be honest, Rebecca, what you're putting out there isn't high end. No wonder you're not attracting those clients. Yeah. Yeah, it's huge on that. I mean, they're looking at your profile as a portfolio. And that's kind of originally why I created my um, profile. And, you know, a lot of people, I always think of social media as the new search engine. They're going to, before they have you at their house, they're going to search you on everything and see what you do. Um, And that's... I just had a um, an episode a couple of weeks ago with an Arizona realtor, um, Jordan Page, about separating a business and um, personal social media. And that's another thing to look at. Um, watch for your personal um, pages as well, because they are going to search you. It's just inevitable. They're going to do it. Um, so be careful with what you have on there. Make it private if you have to, because that could also cost you a customer. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I never really thought of that. I don't have a personal Instagram. That's too much work. (laughs) Oh my gosh. No, I have a personal Facebook, but I never post to it. But that's the other thing is I tend to, for me, I tend to put it all out there on my one main Instagram. So you're seeing the trials and tribulations. You're seeing the family trip. You're seeing a little bit of everything. You're seeing the coaching side. You're seeing the design side. And it, it's basically a holistic view of who I am on my Instagram as opposed to very corporate 
here's uh, the design business. And I, that's a personal choice that I have made. But I know that some designers that like to keep it very separate and it's just their Instagram is just business and then they have their own personal. But I've never thought about that, that you're right, clients, because I don't have one, so I didn't think about it. But yeah, there could be someone who has a personal Instagram where they're posting all kinds of raunchy stuff, but you don't yeah. want a client to find that. Yeah. In in today's day and age, um, especially in the U.S., um, if they post stuff about um, politics, like I think that's just a complete right. no. Um, you don't do that um, if it's going to be public. I, I wouldn't even do it on my even if my page was private. Um, it just that's just something I just would not share. And unfortunately, that's a way a lot of people judge people nowadays. And I don't want that to ruin my business because of that. Mm, yeah. What's what's going on in the U.S. is next level. It's also, <laughs> this is a whole other conversation. It is filtering its way up to Canada. I don't even recognize my own country anymore. It's become so divided. I'm like, what? We are not, this is not us. Yeah. Uh, anyways, I'm not going to have that conversation. But politics <laughs> has become very polarizing. Yeah. Um, and so you're right. Yeah, you do have to be careful unless you intentionally only want to attract a certain segment of the population. And that's your mm -hmm. prerogative. Yeah. Then by all means, put it out there. Um, yeah, I stay away from politics like a 10 yeah. foot. I did poli sci. I was I did a double major and one of my wow. majors is political science. And I do not touch that stuff with a 10 foot pole. <laughs> yeah, I don't blame you at all. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. We've covered like the whole gamut um, from, <laughs> from like, I don't even know, from like the beginning of time to now. And I would love to know before we sign off today, you know, what else, is there anything sort of a last nugget of wisdom that you think would be valuable to share to my audience? Yeah. Um, something I always, if people at, reach out and ask, um, I always say, put yourself in front of the camera. Um, it's hard in the beginning, like I said, in the beginning of the episode, my, my page was very flat. I, it, it was very, um, if you post your designs all the time or just different posts of material finishes and stuff, it's going to become very stale and it's going to become very corporate looking. Um, once you put yourself on the front of the camera, having seen people talk in front of the camera and just seeing your life, it shows a lot for the client um, and it brings life to your account. You'll see a lot more interaction with your posts. You'll see a lot more people DMing you. You'll see a lot more clients calling you. Um, so don't be afraid of putting yourself out there. I, it's, I struggled with it in the beginning. I'm very, very introverted. Um, but when it comes to this stuff now, I think COVID really changed my mind about this all. Um, and I'm not afraid to go in front of the camera now or post a picture of myself on my profile. Um, I really just post and don't think about it or don't go back and look at it the same way as when I, I don't, like we talked about off camera, I don't edit my podcast because I don't like listening to myself. <laughs> so <laughs> I just press post and let it live. If someone says something about it, I don't care because they're not doing the same thing. They're not growing a business like mine or they're not they're not putting themselves um in an uncomfortable situation to grow and i think that's that's huge for yourself to do to, for growth so mm -hmm. definitely put yourself in front of the camera and don't be afraid of what people are saying about it that's excellent advice i can tell you firsthand that has been how i've grown my brand yeah well, hands down putting myself on the camera, whether it's in stories, uh, YouTube, not TikTok. I have a baby following on TikTok. I think I have 70 followers. Woo woo. Just went to 71 last night. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but that has been for me, that's hands down. That's because people got to know me. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Who I am. And yeah, people think they're your friend now. Yeah, totally. And I like that because I'm friendly. <laughs> yeah. It's creepy in the beginning. I'll have to say, um, like if they come up to you and they're like, Eric Doman, I, I know you. And, and I'm like, do you, I'm the type of person that like second guesses everything. And I still think about in my head, did I talk to this person before? How do I know this person? But in reality, I really don't know the person. It's just a follower. Um, but once you get past that, it's fine. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. It is it is a bit weird at first because it's like, actually, sometimes I think it's weirder for the other person than it is for me. They're mm-hmm. nervous to say, I remember, I think it was last summer, I was on vacation with my family. We were in Muskoka. It's like north of Toronto. It's like cottage country. And we were like swimming at a local beach. And this woman was like in the lake with her children. And I was with my daughter. She's like, oh, I just wanted to come over and say, hi, Rebecca. I follow you on Instagram. I'm like, this is so weird. Here I am like in the water. And this person came out, but she's like, oh, I was nervous to say hi. I didn't know if I should say hi. And I was like, absolutely. Like, I love it when people come and say, because then it's like, I know that I'm connecting with people. I know that what I'm doing is resonating. I would so much rather that than someone be afraid to say hi or something oh, yeah. be like, oh, that's Rebecca. I'm afraid to talk to her. Like, I don't want to put that. And that's me. I, I want to be approachable always. Yeah. Um, so I think sometimes it is a bit scarier for the other person because they assume that because you're putting yourself out there, everybody knows who you are. And like, it's kind of, it's just, and, and anyways, it's such a weird head game. Yeah. It's, I, I don't know about you, but sometimes like I post or I, I do my podcast or stuff and I don't know if anybody's actually listening, even though I see the stats and the analytics that people are listening and watching that those are just numbers to me. Like I, I don't actually physically see the people listening to it and watching it. So when I hear or someone comes up to me and talks to him about it, it's kind of cool. Like it's showing that you're doing it and making a difference in some type of way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, this has been awesome. I loved that. I got to have you on my podcast. Yeah. We'll do more of the collaborations um, in the future for sure. I can't wait to follow along and listen to your podcast. I will listen to the episode that I did with you because though I don't like to hear my voice, it's always helpful to hear, I don't know, when there's two people talking and sort of, I don't know, see how the conversation goes and get my own takeaways and share with everyone. Um, Can you let everyone know here who's listening where they can find you? Where's the best place? If they want to say like, hey, Eric, we heard your podcast with Rebecca, where's the best place they can reach you? Yeah, definitely Instagram. Um, and that is Eric Dillman Designs. Um, no spaces. Um, and then I'm I'm on TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter. Oh my god. Pinterest. <laughs> All the places. Uh, I'm not on, um, I'm not I stopped the twit, the tweeting, the Twitter. It was too Yeah, much. I don't really spend a lot of time on there, but I'm on there. <laughs> oh my goodness. The things we do. Oh my gosh. Well, that is awesome. Thank you so much for joining me today, Eric. Thanks for having me. I will have you. You're very welcome. We'll see you soon. Yes. Awesome. Well, what do you think about that? I think Eric has an interesting perspective when it comes to branding, one that is a little bit different than what you commonly hear. I think most designers are told to, you know, put out into the world the design aesthetic that you want to do. And so many of us feel like we need to pigeonhole ourselves, but I would say that a lot of designers don't want that. And that's okay, too. I've had designers say that to me, like, I really enjoy designing modern and sometimes traditional and sometimes using color, but also doing monochromatic. And And I, I think it's an interesting conversation because I see both sides. Anyhow. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed that episode. I'd love to know your thoughts, actually, on the branding conversation. Is it better to put forward one design aesthetic? Or would you rather be able to cater to different clients that have different styles? Uh, Send me a DM. Let me know. I always love to hear your feedback on these episodes. Obviously, please go give Eric's podcast, the pro series, a listen. Obviously, go give it a listen. There's an episode with yours truly. Um, But otherwise, thanks for listening, guys. And we'll see you soon.